Go for it. Start talking. Check, check. One, two, three. Check. Yeah, good. It's good. good. He wants to check. Now you want. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. Yes. How's everybody tonight? Yes. So if everybody ready to praise his name, yes. then come on, let's all stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, Lord, have your way here in this place as we get ready to lift up your holy name here tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. I am 
nothing without you. Yes, yes, Jesus be all, consume every heart. My greatest desire, I give you my heart. Focus my eyes away from myself. Become less, you be lifted high. Oh, yes, oh, yes, you be lifted higher. I belong to you, I am nothing without you. You be lifted high. Oh, yes, oh, yes, you be lifted higher. I belong to you, I am nothing without you. and higher here tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. What's up? All right. <laughs> Amen. All right. Before you sit down, wave to the person on your right. Wave to the person on your left. Wave to the person behind you and be seated. Trying to continue with our social distancing. Help us, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Lots of great things happening. Check out your bulletin so you know what's going on. All the great things that are coming up and happening. One note I do want to make is um, with um, July 4th, we won't have Saturday night church on July 4th because of the holiday, and so spend that time with your family, but we'll have the morning services on Sunday, 8, 15, 10, 45. Just make that note. That'll be coming out in the announcements uh, the next week or two, and so we want you to be aware of that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who's a happy, hilarious giver tonight? Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I am. I have Zach's tithe. He put it in my pocket today. He said, Dad, bring my tithe. I said, why don't you bring it? Well, i got to go to work. Okay, so there you go. So if you are giving tonight, you can give five ways. The easiest way is the app, or you can bring it to the front, or the ushers are in the back with also an offering envelope if you want to give in person. So let's stand, and let's pray over the offering tonight. Father God, we're so grateful. So grateful that we get the privilege to sow into your kingdom. So grateful that, Lord, we get to see lives touched and hearts change as we simply give according to your word. I pray tonight, Lord, that you would bless every gift that we give and whatever is given, Lord, whether it's our tithes, whether it's our faith commitments to missions, whether it's our vision 2020 money, whatever it is, Lord, we want to see more lives changed, more hearts touched. So, Father, bless every gift in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen and amen. You can bring your gift front or to the back, and then we'll remain standing for worship. Welcome. 
welcome here in this place you are welcome and if they're watching in the homes you are welcome in the homes right now Lord Lord you know everybody's need hallelujah 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 here I am down on my knees again surrender
I hunger and thirst. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. With arms stretched wide, I know you hear my cry. Speak to me now. Oh, yes. Speak to me now. Oh, yes. And I prayer tonight, Lord. It's our prayer tonight. We make it an offering to you that we surrender all, all our attitudes, all our inconsistencies, all our wants and desires, everything. We just lay it at your feet because our desire is more of you and less of us. More of you, more of your spirit, more of your power, more of your grace. That's what's going to change the world. That's what's going to bring peace. That's what's going to settle all the divide that we see across our nation. Is when we surrender us. We surrender the self-centered and the, the desires of our heart. And we just say, all of you, Lord, less of me. So, Lord, we just give it all to you right now as an offering. And I pray tonight that you'd fill it with the word. Fill it 
with the word that Pastor Ron will bring through Kingdom Disciples. Fill it with the word that the men will have and man up. Fill it with the word, Lord, that the boys and girls will have in Bible Explorers and in the nursery and the preschool. So that we can be filled to overflowing of your love and your mercy and your grace and change the world. So help us, Lord. We pray for those in our midst who couldn't be with us tonight, Lord, who are watching online on Facebook and YouTube, Lord. We think of Jan that had those cancers removed from her head today. We just speak healing to her body right now. Peace and rest at home. Touch this precious uh, servant of the Lord who's always faithful to serve at the Welcome Center and, and give of her time, not only Wednesday, but on the weekend, Lord. So touch her body tonight, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy covering her right now. We pray the same thing for Paul, Tony's husband, Lord. Father God, we curse that cancer in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray healing in Paul's body according to your word. We just leave Paul in your hands. Lord, when the doctors say there's nothing they can do, we trust the great physician. We trust in the hand of the master. And so, Lord, we thank you for Paul. And we just pray that you'd cover both he and Tony. Lord, as Tony is a cancer survivor, Claiming her healing all these years, Lord, we're believing the same thing for her precious husband now. So, Lord, have your way. Thank you for the young people as they went off to the River Day today with the other two churches. Thank you for the body of Christ coming together and enjoying the beauty of what you've given to us here. I pray blessing on Pastor Angie as I'm sure she's tired for being an old gal. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. She's older than me. So give her rest tonight, Lord, when she gets home. And so, Father, we just thank you for the influence she has and Pastor John and Pastor Stephen and Pastor Matthew and all the young people that they were able to bless today and have some time finally to be together and out. So, Lord, we give you this night. We thank you. We thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. Oh, come on, say amen like you mean it. Man, you may be seated. If you're going to man up, you're headed out the door with uh, Mr. Malone and Jim and all the guys back there. And uh, you're in here for Bible, for the Bible study that's uh, titled uh, Kingdom Disciples. And if you're watching on Facebook and YouTube, we welcome you tonight. And we pray the Spirit of God touch you. Let's give Pastor Ron a big hand as he comes to teach the Word tonight. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hey Amen. You're in for a great, exciting study tonight. Not because of me, but because of our future speaker, Dr. Tony Evans. If you're not familiar with Dr. Evans' ministry, he preaches at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship or Church there in Fort Worth, Texas. Great speaker. I think he's one of the finest speakers in America, one of the finest Bible teachers. And I encourage you, uh, when you can't make it to church and it's not being televised, you're sick, you want to look at a good program on Sunday, just go to YouTube and type in this on the search, Dr. Tony Evans, and all his messages will come up, and you can pick and choose what you want to hear. And they're all very, very good. Well, you're in for an exciting study tonight. This is the second week of Kingdom Disciples. By the way, that last song that we sang, that was a Kingdom Disciples song. Because if you listen to the lyrics, that's what it's talking about, making Christ the Lord of your life. Now, last week, we talked about the missing key. Can you tell me what that missing key is? Anybody remember? What is the missing key of discipleship? Making Christ the Lord of your life. And Lord means what? Lord means to be the supreme ruler of everything, of my time, my talent, my money, whatever I have. It's not what I want, it's what you want. It's not where I want to go, it's where you want me to go. And when Jesus says jump, we say how high. That's when you become a king of disciple. Now a lot of people think that king of the disciple or being a disciple is just going out and witnessing one-on-one -on -one to people, and that is part of it. It's a good part of it. Jesus said, you will be witnesses to me here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I get that. But we need to remember that King of Disciples is also meant for nominal church members. And I don't know about this church, but in the church I pastored for 33 years, we had a lot of nominal Christians. And what I mean by that is people who show up on Sunday morning, and maybe even for Sunday school, and maybe Wednesday night, but uh, going to service, that was about as far as it went. 
And we had a sign, just like you have a sign, that said you are now entering the mission field. But I think so many people just kind of bypass those kind of signs. And we begin to think that that's for somebody else. It's not really for me. Somebody else needs to be a disciple. But Jesus said, go into all the world. He said, make disciples. And we saw last week that's not, that was not a suggestion. That was a command. A command given to each and every one of us. And here's the thing, guys. God will hold us responsible for how well we really obeyed that command. If we're going to change the world, as Pastor Graham just said, if you're going to change the community you live in, start with first. If you're going to change your family, you've got to become a kingdom-minded disciple. And so last week we talked about the missing key, of course, making Christ the Lord of your life. Tonight we're going to talk about the primary concern. What is the primary concern of being a kingdom disciple? And you all have your study sheets out here. Too bad that on a video they don't have that. But uh, when you get ready to come to church, we'll give you one. Well, maybe we can have some copies made up and you can have them later on if, you, if you'd like to have them. I suggest that you get a, a little binder like this and keep the lessons in a binder. Punch some holes in them and keep them. Something you can refer back to. Great when you have a chance to teach a group, maybe a Bible study group in your home or whatever. Great thing to go over. You don't have to have the video because you'll have all the stuff here. You can do it without the video. Of course, if you want the video, you can get it from, uh, you can get it from Tony Evans or you can get, to go get it from Christian bookstores, isn't it? Christian bookstores, they have it. So, let's <clears throat> paper here. So anyway, without further ado, let's have Dr. Tony Evans. And if you have your study shoes, just... Put them down. Just, I want you to listen to Dr. Evans. We'll have all the answers for you and the fill-ins at the end of the service tonight. So you won't miss a thing. All right. God bless. Welcome to session two of our series, Kingdom Disciples, Heaven's Representative on Earth. In this session, we want to deal with the primary concern of discipleship. It's stated clearly in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God's primary concern is his kingdom. God's kingdom is his rule, and he wants his kingdom to be first. God can do a lot of things, but one of the things he can do is be second, nor can his rule be second. And when you learn to prioritize his rule and his standards, you get the benefit of discipleship. So let's find out what first really looks like and what it looks like when his kingdom is front and center in your life. My favorite place to go is New York City on vacation. I love the glitz and the glitter and the, all the cuisine and Broadway and just every kind of person from all around the world. Love to go to New York. When my wife goes with me and we're on vacation, she loves New York too, particularly Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Fifth Avenue are where all the fancy stores are and that's where her favorite store is, Saks. Saks Fifth Avenue. It's known for its display windows. If you go there during Christmas time, you will see magnificent displays that capture the attention of people gathered all around. People line all the way around the building to see the displays. During the normal year, those display windows are filled with mannequins that are known as dummies. These are good-looking mannequins, well-dressed mannequins. In fact, I saw a mannequin one day sitting in a Ferrari. I mean, they, they, they do it up in Saks Fifth Avenue windows. Now, the reason why they do this with the mannequins, they make this display with the dummies, is because Saks Fifth Avenue knows that dummies like us walking up Fifth Avenue. You see, what they want their mannequin to achieve is to draw me off the street, to draw us off the street into a kingdom called sex. They want 
the ones they have put on display to be advertisement so that once drawn off the street, there's floor after floor after floor after floor of so much more to offer. God has kingdom disciples who he wants to put on public display because of their identification and baptism to be an attraction to the kingdom of God. God's concern is the advertisement of his kingdom. Oh yeah, it starts with conversion, but then it moves to kingdom rule. And so the concept of being a kingdom disciple is to be a Christian, a believer, who is progressively participating in the process of learning what it is to live all of life under the lordship, rulership, kingship of Jesus Christ. And so I want to give you now the master key to being a kingdom disciple. If you get this key, then you will be able to lock or unlock all the doors of your world and your life. We'll learn about it later, but it's called binding and loosing, permitting or forbidding, that is exercising kingdom authority. What is this master key that will, like my master key at, at our church or at the Urban Alternative, our national ministry, that means it, it, it unlocks every door because it's a master key. If you do not understand or operate with the master key, then you got to find individual keys and, and try to see what works where. So I'm going to give you the master key for every lock of your life, every door of your circumstance. Jesus preached a sermon. It is the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest preacher who's ever preached, Jesus Christ, and you know it well. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And as he proclaims the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, he gives the master key to his kingdom message in Matthew 6, 33. He simply says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Most people today have smartphones. And they usually have a password that will give you access to a whole world of information, a whole world of data. In this small phone, once you use the right password, you gain access to more than you could ever imagine because it houses the world in this device. God, in this one verse, Situated in this one sermon is given the master key. The primary concern that you should have as a kingdom disciple. To seek ye first the kingdom. Now we've already said the kingdom is God's divine rule. The theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about one subject. One of the reasons that people have trouble making sense of all the different things that the Bible is talking about is because they do not understand the one subject of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the one subject of the Bible is the glory of God through the advancement of his kingdom. That is the one subject, although it is reflected in different ways in different times to different groups of people. But it's about this rule of God, this overarching program in history where God would express his rule through mankind before men. In understanding that you are to seek, pursue this kingdom, you are pursuing his rule. That's why we talk so much about the kingdom in 
our ministry, the urban alternative, kingdom man, kingdom woman, raising kingdom kids, kingdom marriage, and now kingdom disciples. Because it's all about the rule of God. God would call all the men together three times a year, according to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 34, verses 23 and 24. And he'd tell all the men, leave the women and children home. I just want all the males and, and, and all the men. And it uses three different Hebrew names for God, uh, Elohim, Yahweh, and Adonai. And he says, I want all the men to come under my roof, under my rule. And he says, if I can get all the men to come under my roof and under my rule, I'm going to send you back to your family and send you back to your, your homes. And when I send you back, you will be covered, you will be protected, and no nation will be able to take what you have because you've listened to the Lord your God. When God created Adam, he gave him instructions on how he was to rule. Satan's job is to remove us from the pursuit of the kingdom. Once you're in the kingdom because you've accepted Christ, you can't do anything about that. But as long as you are going to heaven and you're no good for earth, he'll live with that. Because he knows there'll be no impact, there'll be no influence, there'll be no difference made. The Bible is about pursuing this kingdom. I used to be chaplain for the Dallas Cowboys. My son has taken over that role since uh, he's, he finished his NFL stint, and, and uh, now he's, he's now the chaplain. And when I was chaplain, uh, I was chaplain doing the Roger Staubach, Tony Dorsett, Drew Pearson era. And I would go out, and I would literally work out with the team, okay? Uh, this was a way of me living my dream. And so <laughs> I would go, and I would wor literally work out. So Roger Starbucks in practice would throw me passes as they got in the passing line, and I would just be having a great time out there as chaplain of the team. As chaplain, I learned some of the plays. As chaplain, I learned some of the plays, and... One particular play was what we call a fly pattern. A fly pattern is where the quarterback receives the ball, he backs up, and the receiver runs straight down the field seeking to outrun the defender, and he hurls it in the air in order to score a touchdown in one play. It's called a fly pattern, to score a touchdown in one play. But many times, many times, the defense, the other team, is what we call blitzing, blitz the play. Now, blitz, for you non-football people, is where the linebacker or defensive back pauses, waits, and then tries to come in quickly to tackle the quarterback before he has a chance to throw the ball to score a touchdown in one play. Well, God called a kingdom play, and he called the kingdom play to... Israel. And Israel would be his kingdom community through which he would reach the whole world. They were to be lights to the whole world. The problem is Satan blitzed the play. He came in and he got the Jewish leaders to reject Jesus Christ, to say crucify him, so that they did not get the kingdom that Jesus came to offer. All through the Gospels, Jesus says, I have come to preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. I'm right in your midst. Let's get this kingdom thing working where I'm ruling on behalf of my father over the whole earth through Israel. But Satan blitzed the play. But when I was working out with the Cowboys, they had an alternative scheme if a blitz occurred. If a blitz occurred, there was what they called a waggle. Now, a waggle is where the halfback peels off to the side so that if the quarterback gets in trouble because the enemy has blitzed the play, he becomes an alternative option to the original signal called. So when Roger Starback saw he did not have time to throw the touchdown in one play, because this blitz, this other team was getting ready to tackle him, he would turn to the side and shuttle the pass over to the halfback who had just peeled off to the side as another option, but the option was to accomplish the same goal. The first goal was a touchdown to 
the receiver. But because of the blitz, the goal now was a touchdown through the running back. Well, God called a kingdom touchdown pass to Israel. Satan blitzed, blitzed the play, but God had a waggle. So what God did was he called the church into being. And the church would be the new mechanism through which he would express his kingdom rule in history until such time he renewed it with his people, Israel. So you are God's waggle. <laughs> you and I making the church of Jesus Christ. When he said he'd hand the kingdom over to another group of people, that's you and I. So you and I are God's waggle. We are his official representatives to represent his presence, his person, and his authority in history. He says, I want you to seek or pursue my kingdom. Seek the kingdom. Pursue the kingdom. And pursue the righteousness of the kingdom. The righteousness are the standards by which the kingdom operates. The rules by which the kingdom works. God's kingdom does not often follow the rules of the culture. God's kingdom does not often follow the rules of popular opinion. God's kingdom does not often follow the rules of what society views as, as, views as acceptable. In fact, you and I are living in a day when the rules are changing at warp speed. When things that we have cherished are being either rejected or redefined. The tragedy is when Christians are adopting the rules of the opposing teams in the culture and not the standards that emanate from God. Let, let me say this clearly. God has spoken and he has not stuttered. There are two answers to every question. God's answer and everybody else's. And everybody else is wrong when they disagree with God. And that's why the key word in this phrase is the word first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Uh, let me say it again because some of you didn't hear me. First. There are certain things God can't do. Now, I know we're used to saying God can do everything, but let me tell you some things God can't do. God can't sin. Okay, he cannot commit a sin. He can bear our sin, but he cannot commit a sin because he's perfect in all of his ways. The Bible says God cannot sin. So that's something God can't do. Let me tell you something else God can't do. He can't be second. Can't be second. He must be first. All through the Bible, you see this word first. Bring me the first fruits. Return to your first love. That Jesus Christ might have first place in everything. When Jesus was talking to folks he wanted to follow in discipleship, and they said, well, I got to go back and bury my father first. Jesus says, no, you first pursue the kingdom. You first pursue the kingdom of God. The reason why we're not experiencing more of God's authority is that he's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. He's not first and he can't be second. But I shall have no other God before me. I must be first. First in your priorities, first in your passions, and most importantly, first in your decisions. Many people, many Christians, come to God because nothing else has worked. <laughs> and he is the last resort. They have not sought him first in their decisions. Uh, a lot of people are baseball fans. Now, I'm not a baseball guy, okay? It moves a little bit too slow for me. <laughs> yeah, it moves a little bit too slow for me. But baseball is America's sport, and, and uh, you know, it's... Uh, every, every, a lot of people just love baseball. Now, in baseball, when you hit the ball, you got to go to first base. If you miss 
first base. The fact that you touch second, third, and home plate is irrelevant because they will throw you out. Because <laughs> the whole deal is you got to touch first base first for all the other bases to matter. The other bases don't matter if you miss first. He says, I want you to seek first the rule of God. That simple shifting of priority to say, God, your thinking on a matter will be my first thing I go to, my first perspective to try to understand, my first action to take. Shifts how God can relate to you. Because now it is clear God is not just one number among many. He is your priority. And why shouldn't he be, given who he is, if he's the king? If you found out that the president wanted to meet with you, regardless of your political persuasion, a lot of things would adjust. A lot of preparation would change because the head of state wanted to meet with you. If he called you and said, I'm in your town and I want to meet with you right away, I'm sure schedules would adjust. I'm sure schedules would change. Why? Because the head of state has said, I need to meet. If we do that, if, if we do this for a human potentate, president, or head of state, how much more should our response to Jesus Christ not be first, not be at the top of the list? And if we can get Christians to put God in the front of the line rather than in the middle or the back of the line, they would see much more of God at work in their life. If they would approach what God says about a subject first and not what their neighbors say, not even what their mates say, not even how they feel. Let me give you an illustration. The world fell into sin because Adam disobeyed God. Adam is the one blamed for the fall of the human race, not Eve, Adam. Sorry, man, Adam. <laughs> Adam is blamed. We talk about what Adam did. He ate of the forbidden fruit. But we don't often talk about why Adam did it. What led Adam to rebel against God is he chose his wife over God. His emotional attachment to Eve. See, Eve ate the fruit. Eve brought the fruit to him. So he has a decision to make. Will my love for my wife trump my obedience first to God? So God wants to be first, even over our emotions and our relationships. So this thing of first is no small thing. He says, seek ye first his rule, his kingdom, and his standards his righteousness. And then he comes with a kingdom promise because this whole sermon is about the kingdom. He comes with a kingdom promise and all these things will be added to you. This whole passage in Matthew 6 starts off with an instruction to not worry. Okay? Don't be anxious. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, the clothes that you wear. He says, you've never seen a bird with an ulcer. <laughs> no. You've never seen a bird bleeding because it's, it's worry. You don't see, you don't, you don't see flowers unclothed. He says, nature understands God better than Christians because he's talking to his disciple. He says, Nat nature understands how this works, okay? You know, 
the Bible says God feeds the birds, right? But you've never seen a bird sitting on a branch with its beak open waiting for worms to drop from heaven. They go worm hunting, but the point is they assume that God has a worm. So they go get what has been provided. What he says is, learn a lesson from nature. Learn a lesson from the, from, from the kingdom of animals and birds and flowers. He says, aren't you more valuable than they? And then he comes to this kingdom message. He leads into it by saying, look, your heavenly father already knows you need these things. So this is not an information gathering situation. This is a priority situation. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? The things that God has pre-planned for your life for you to experience and have. Only as a kingdom disciple, a visible, verbal, full-time representative of Jesus Christ, can you expect to receive all that God has determined for you to have because you're operating under his rule. When you buy an appliance, they give you a warranty. The warranty says for this period of time, we have you covered. If something's not working out, call us and we will respond because this is our product and we want to look good with our customers and we will make the provision so that this product is working for you. But we'll, what they will not warranty is abusing the product. If you take a hammer and start slamming it and pick it up and start throwing it down, You've negated the warranty because you've misused the product. See, a lot of people call on God to fix broken stuff in their life. A lot of cultures call on God when they can't fix what's happening in their environment. And then they wonder why they're not hearing from heaven. When the answer is, you done messed over the product. You've not sought first the kingdom of God. You just want him to fix up your mess up. But you have not handled the product of his kingdom the way he has prescribed by means of his righteousness, his standard. And therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that all these things aren't coming together because you are destroying what I've asked you to represent. You're not representing me well. All these things will be added to you. And when all these things are added to you, guess what he says he will remove from you? Worry. He says, I will take away your worry. You won't have to worry anymore. Why? Because I got your back. You know, when I was growing in, up in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, a lot of times we didn't have food and because my father didn't get work. He was a longshoreman. He loaded and unloaded ships. And if the ship didn't come in or his group wasn't called, he wouldn't work. And sometimes that would go on for days, weeks, and months. But I never went to bed worried. My congregation knows and people who have heard us on the radio know I don't eat fish. I don't eat fish of any kind. And the reason I don't eat fish is because when my father didn't have work, he went fishing to feed the family. And the fish he caught was herring. Herring a little fish with a billion bones. And all of them are small. So when my father didn't have work, we had herring for breakfast, herring for lunch, and herring for dinner with some herring thrown in for dessert. We had more fish. So I don't eat fish today because I've never recovered from herring. But still, I never went to bed worried because my eating the next day was daddy's problem. And I know daddy had me covered. And so even though things weren't going well, it would be daddy's responsibility 
to make sure his family had something to eat. God says, if you operate in my kingdom, under my rule, according to my standards, then what I will do is I will cover you because you put me first. If you accept Christ, you're in the kingdom. But now he's not talking about being in it. He's talking about operating under it. That's why he attaches his righteousness to the kingdom. It's not just being in it because you're saved. It's being under it because his standards rule. May you take the master key, unlock the doors of every area of your life, and go to sleep at night knowing that your daddy the king has covered your back. Your daddy, the king, has got you covered. Everybody say amen out there. What a great thought that is. He didn't know that you were a waggle people, did you? That's what we are. We're God's alternate plan right now. But we don't want to fail like Israel failed. We want to get the job done. And to get the job done, we've got to become kingdom disciples. So take out your study guides, and we'll go over this. And uh, the answers will come up on the screen. Miraculously, <laughs> he's got it covered back there. People learn to read early in their education. Reading forms a foundation that allows us to interact with many of other disciples, disciplines. It's foundational. As we work our way through school, we move from the basics of reading to reading with comprehension. One key understanding that you read is the ability to identify the main point of the book. Says the Bible also has a main point, and the primary concern of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Tony said, is the glory of God through the advancement of his kingdom. Look at the definition of a kingdom disciple. is a Christian who progressively participates in the process of learning what it is to live under the lordship, the rulership, the kingship of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. It's learning what it is to live under the lordship, the rulership, the kingship of Jesus Christ. Not just being saved. I ask you to put your hands up if you're saved. I hear not 100% of the people would raise their hand here today. But this, we're not talking about that. As he closed this message, he said the same thing. The primary concern that you should have as a kingdom disciple, here's the fill-in, first one, seek first the kingdom of God. So how does one do that? How do you know if you're putting God first in your life? Well, when you look at Matthew 6, Tony gave the answers there, didn't he? He said, from Genesis to Revelation, one subject of the Bible is to glorify God through the advancement of his kingdom. And remember, he said Israel was first given the responsibility, but they failed to carry it out. But God's backup plan, if you will, was the church. It was the church under the lordship of the Son of God that we were given the responsibility. Now, get this for a minute. Bracket that. We, you, me, were given the responsibility to advance God's kingdom. Now, think about what a privilege that is. God is trusting you. Now, take your fingers and say, me. Come on. God is trusting me. He's trusting us to help advance the kingdom and... Uh, it's not everyone else. We always think it's somebody else. No, it's not everyone else. It's, it's you. It's me. God's trusting us to do that. Righteousness, he said, is the standard by which the kingdom operates by the rules which the kingdom works. So what does righteousness define? What is righteousness anyway? We hear it talked about all the time. You know, your pastor talks about it all the time. I used to talk about righteousness and all that. We hear that name all the time. But what is What is righteousness? Righteousness, in its simplest understanding, is to be in right standing with God. In right standing with God. And I want to submit to you tonight that you're not in right standing with God until you become a kingdom disciple. You may be saved. Hopefully you are. We're on our way to heaven. We've got our ticket to ride. But we're not in right standing in the aspect of being a kingdom disciple because he wants us to advance the kingdom. Dr. Evans said, there are two answers to every question, God's answer and everybody else's. 
And everybody else is wrong when they disagree with God. And I put down there, always. They're always wrong. Somebody comes up to you and gives you a secular idea about what's right and what's wrong, and you show them that through the Bible, through the Word of God, that that's not what God says. And uh, you don't have to argue with them anymore. God's right, and they're wrong. Period. So what is he saying? What's, what's Dr. Evans saying? He's saying that God must be first in your priorities. There's the fill-in. Passions and decisions. He must be first in your priorities, passions, and he said, most importantly, your decisions. Your decisions are what make you or break you, if you will, in this life. I had so many people in my, when I was pastoring that would come in for pastoral counseling. And it was a result, most of the time, their problems, wrong decisions they made in life. Uh, people make right decisions and wrong decisions. So we need to think out. We need to put our thinking caps on and do the right thing. And, make, and, and you do that when God is first in your life, that you make the right decisions. I can't tell you how many times uh, over the years that uh, uh, I was at my wit's end, didn't know what to do. <clears throat> and I said, Lord... I didn't have this outline here then. And I just said, Lord, I need you to know what you want me to do. I want your will, your decision. What should I do? Help, help me to make the right decision. Now, whether that was going out maybe to buy another car, to trade cars, or if it's something more important, decisions. By the way, you could buy a wrong car at the wrong time, be upside down, and get yourself in a financial mess. How many people came to me and over the years because of that? So because you have decided to become a king of disciple, you have decided that, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, right? Say, yes, that's right, Pastor. That's right. All right. It means that you are now a full-time representative, not a part-time representative. God's got too many of those. He doesn't need any part-time help. He needs some full-time help. So it means that you're a full-time representative of, of Jesus Christ. As such, you now operate. There's a fill-in. You now operate under his rules, not yours. God is not looking, again, for part-timers. It's not my way, it's his way. God tells us that because we're now striving to be kingdom disciples, living under his authority and rule, he will cover us. And that's what Tony ended with. He will cover you. I like being covered. When I bought a car, the first thing I'm going to know after I looked at the shiny thing and got, and got all the shit, the bells and whistles and those all excited about it. The first thing I asked the salesman after that, is, what kind of warranty does this thing have? I wanted to make sure I was covered. And in the Christian life, in life itself, he will cover us now. Not because we're saved. He will cover you because you decided to become a kingdom disciple. I'll cover you. Uh, so what does cover mean? It means he will supply all your needs. Uh, he'll plus give you the authority to do his work. So don't fear God. So you don't fear God because God has your back all the time. He always has your back. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing more important to know. There's somebody standing behind me that if I make a mistake... And I make it ignorantly, and I'm trying to do the best that he's got my back. It's not going to hurt me. Dr. Evans said that one of the subjects in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that trumps all others is the subject of God's glory. There's a fill-in, God's glory. So how can we bring God's glory? You got any out there? How, how can we bring God's glory in our lives? Anybody? Yes. Do what? Do what he tells us to do, yes. Somebody else. Be obedient. Somebody else. What does it mean to bring God glory? In your life, particularly, in your life, what does it mean to bring God glory in your life? Huh? Praise him, Praise him worship him. That's part of it. But in the context of what we're studying tonight, what does it mean to bring God glory? Do what? Reach the lost. And also, as we found out last week, not only reach the lost, but reach the nominal church member. As I said in the opening tonight, this church is like every other church. It has its share of nominal church members. And 
your job is not only to go out and reach the lost as a disciple, and that's a big part of it. It's also to be a kingdom representative to the people that you go to church with. You know, a lot of people in church don't have the slightest idea what it means to really follow Christ. Oh, they've been saved, and they're getting some of it, but they don't really understand this high idea about kingdom life, what it, what it means to really make Christ the Lord of your life, that he's Lord over everything, and that the idea and, and the understanding that he's got your back when you're doing his work, to be part of the kingdom. They don't have a clue. So it's up for us as kingdom disciples because you want to be kingdom disciples, right? Now it's your turn to take it to the church. Look around you at all these empty chairs. I know a lot of us because of COVID-19. I know that. But even if it wasn't COVID-19, they all wouldn't be filled. You know that. Why aren't they filled? I don't want to pass judgment. I just say there's a lot of nominal Christians in our churches, not just this church. I had my share, believe me. And now John has his share. Okay. Dr. Evans talked about a master key to the kingdom that unlock, there's the feeling, unlock all that God has for you. He said, then you don't have all God's blessings and leadership in your life is because you only have a key that opens certain rooms in your Christian life. He said, maybe it's a key to Bible study. You're, you're doing Bible study at your home and that's a wonderful thing. He said, maybe it's... Uh, the key to evangelism, you're good at that. You enjoy going out to talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And so, I know that sometimes that's just a, that's a, real, that's a real blessing to have that. I know some people, some guys that just, they live to share one-on-one -on -one with people, the gospel. And that's a great thing. Uh, and so evangelism, maybe it's a, a person of good works. But Tony says, maybe God has given you the key of leadership. And these are all good, but he said, you know what? It's not the master key. So what is the master key? He talked about it. God's rule in your life over everything in your life. It's when you make a purposeful, there's the, there's the fill in, a purposeful decision that makes Jesus more than just your savior. It's when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, as we said at the beginning. You no longer just have religion. Got that old time religion. Give me that old time. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's got to be more than just religion. Uh, that you practice once a week or maybe twice a week. Now Jesus, he said, is number one in your life, seven days a week, 365 days a year. He is Lord and all, that in, and all that that entails in every area of your life. He said, wow, preacher, that's a lot. Am I supposed to give God everything? Yeah, because he said he wants to be first. The church is God's plan, as we said, to assert his kingdom rule over the world. How's our group here at Riverside contributing to that mission? Well, I would suggest that we are learning how to become kingdom disciples by going through the study, and that's good. Kingdom disciples are not just saved, born-again Christians. We've established that. They decided to become, I like this, game changers. It's on your outline. Purposely reaching out to the lost in our community as well as nominal Christians in our churches that need somebody to come alongside them in discipleship. Many, many saved people need to be discipled. So many nominal Christians in our churches. And I suggest to you that's the reason why we're having a lot of trouble right now in our nation and in our world. Dr. Evans said, you and I are living in a day when the rules are changing at warp speed, and I believe that. Should we continue to seek God first when our culture is dismantling his standards of righteousness? Well, Remember, God's word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He says, I change not, say the Lord. Well, if that is true, and it certainly is, it means that God's standards have not changed, even though the culture has. Folks, we are New Testament Christians, yet the Ten Commandments are in force for us as much as they were for the Israelites. And I was going to take time, but I won't do that tonight, to go to Exodus chapter 22, and read for you the Ten Commandments. You might want to go over those again. I am the Lord thy God. I shall have no other gods before me. First. And then he goes through the series of commands. Don't make any graven image. Why? Because I'm going to be first. Don't bow down, to, bow down to them. Don't do anything with them. And then he said, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. And do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not murder. 
You get the picture right there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he tells us that we, we are to submit to his authority, we're to submit to that, and we are to complete that. Listen, if the Jews tried to do that, uh, and of course they tried to do it to gain salvation, but we, we do it because we want to please God, because it's God's standard. So what happens when we choose the rules of the world instead of the standards that come from God? Chaos. Chaos happens in our lives. When we do this, we are in complete... I want you to look at this on your outline. We put it on there. When you do this, when you decide you're going to live by the standards of the world instead of by God's standards, you are in complete rebellion to God. That's not a good place to be. And we must remember that we have been bought with a price, and that makes us bought and paid for merchandise. I used to say that all, all the time in my church and my messages. What was the price you asked? You know what it is. The precious blood of Jesus Christ shed for your sins. While in rebellion and a rebellious state, we need not expect anything from God. Why is it God doing this for me? I don't understand why God's blessing everybody else and not blessing me. Maybe it's because you're in rebellion. The blessings of heaven are cut off from you then when you're in rebellion. It's just not going to happen. Now, this is not on your outline. You're done pretty much. But the key word in Matthew 6.33 is first. Why is it so tempting for us to make God second in our priorities? Why is it so tempting to do that? Anybody got an answer for that? Why is it so tempting to make God second, third, or fourth? Somewhere down the line. What? Because of worldly ways. Yeah, we want to fit in, don't we? We want to fit in with society. We want to look like the oddball out there. I'm going to tell you, there's benefits being a kingdom disciple. When you start putting yourself under God, I told you God's got your back. I've got to tell you this little story. I told my wife I was going to tell you this tonight. I was out with Pastor Tom today trying to fly airplanes. <laughs> now, he's a good flyer, but I am not. And uh, I have this plane, plane I call my crash plane. It's my plane I'm learning with, and I've crashed it many, many times. And it's been repaired many, many times. In fact, he told me today, he says, I don't know how you can keep repairing that airplane. <laughs> I said, well, I get it up there, it flies. Anyway, I crashed it again today. I didn't crash it in the short grass. I didn't crash it in the intermediate grass. No. I had to crash it way out there in those tall brambles and those thorn bushes there, those blackberry bushes. Some of them were this high, trampling through there. And I'm out there for about 20 minutes. Finally, Tom calls me. He says, where are you at? Where are you at? I didn't know where I was at. I was out there in the woods. And I was give out. I was hot. And of course, I got a breathing problem anyway. So this is, if God is, if, if I'm lying, I'm dying right here. I said, well, if all else fails, pray. <laughs> I got to pray. And I did like this. I said, I didn't get down the dirt. I got like I said, Lord, you got to help me. I said, I'm give out. I'm tired. And, uh, but I can't afford just to give this airplane up. I don't have any money to buy another one. Help me to find it. In Jesus' name, amen. And I swear to Almighty God in heaven, this is true. The minute I said amen, I lifted my head up and I heard a beep, beep, beep. That motor was pulsating out there, like 30 feet away from me. I walked right to it. God's got your back, amen. <laughs> Even with the little things like that. I'm glad God's got my back. Oh, uh, listen, as a kingdom disciple, our attitude should be go, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. When you say jump, I'll say ha hi. The reason we put God second in our life is because we want what we want instead of what God wants. Is that not true? We want what we want. We want to decide how much time we give the Lord. We want to decide how much, what kind of service we are willing to render. Basically, folks, it comes down to this. We want to call the shots in our lives instead of God. But I want to tell you something. You're going to get in a whole lot of trouble, and you already know this when you, let, when you decide to call the shots in your life. But how much better it is when you let God call the shots in your life. You know why? You ever been in an airplane? You're flying around, you look out the window, and you're in a commercial jet, or maybe even a smaller airplane. I like to go in smaller airplanes. It's getting a little lower. But you look out, and you see the panorama just out before you. You see the the big picture, if you will. Amen? 
And you can see from here to way over there, sometimes hundreds of miles away, because you're up 30,000 feet. You can't make out a lot of definition, but you can see everything. God sees everything. I had a preacher tell me this one time. He said, we, we're kind of like worms crawling around on the ground, or little animals crawling on the ground, if I can say it that way. We're just looking ahead of us all the time. We can't see too far ahead to the front of us or to the side or certainly not to the back. We don't see anything up there too much. So we're, we just live this way all the time. But when we live that way, we make mistakes. There's liable to be a ditch out there. There may be a rattlesnake over there we're going to crawl onto. We don't know. Ah, but when God is there, he has the big picture. He looks down. And he sees you crawling in the wrong direction. He sees that rattlesnake. He sees that ditch. He sees that obstacle. And he guides you around it. And most of the time, you don't even know he guides you around it. I don't know how many accidents I should have been in. When I climbed that ladder last April, not this past April, April before, and I fell and I should have been dead. God knew all about that. I've asked myself, why did you let me do that? I said, to get your attention. He got my attention. When you get in touch with your mortality, you get your attention. God gets your attention real quick. Kingdom discipleship. I hope this course is really going to be something more than just another Wednesday night Bible study for you. I hope you'll make a little booklet. I got a little more to say here, but I'm not going to keep you very long. But uh, I hope you'll, you'll do this with the intent of really deciding... Making this not going to just be another ordinary Wednesday night study. Well, oh, that was all right. Tony was good. Pastor Barber, he was, uh. But I'm going to decide to become a kingdom. So I'm going to make a difference. I'm tired of ruling my own life. I'm tired of running the show, calling the shots because I make the wrong calls so many times. I want somebody at my back. I want somebody to cover me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had tonight. Thank you for the message that Tony brought. God, help us to be kingdom disciples. Lord, that's what you need more than anything else. Oh, you want people to be saved. You're not willing that any should be to perish. Your word tells us that very, very clearly, what a heart you have for mankind. But you've given us the responsibility. We're your waggle plan. We're the church. And by and large, as Tony has shown us, and he'll show us in the coming lessons, we have forfeited that. We don't do it. We're not fulfilling our mission so much of the time. I think of all the churches that are in the world and all the Christians that are here in the world. And I know what you did with just 12. And there are millions of Christians around the world. Why isn't this world changed so much for the better? It's not that they're not saved and going to heaven, those who've confessed you as Lord and Savior and received you. Because we're not kingdom makers. We're not kingdom disciples. We're not making disciples. The last thing you told us when you left planet Earth is go make disciples. That's the last thing I want you to remember, folks. Go make disciples. That's what he said. So help me, help us to be obedient to that command. Help us to be open, to say every day, Lord, lead me to somebody who's lost. Lead me to some, another Christian who's confused. Help me to be a kingdom disciple in everyday life, out there where the rubber meets the road, and our decision-making, and the way we react to problems. That's all part of being a kingdom disciple. And people will see us and know that we've placed you first in our lives, not second or third. And they'll say, you know, I don't know what's different about old Ron or John or Susie or Mary or whatever your name may be, but they've got it together. They'll see it, and they'll want what you have. I'm talking about Christian to Christian now even. And that's your green light to go. So help us to be kingdom disciples. Put us in touch with people who need you, who need to be discipled in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>